Yeah, that was Yoga Sutra chapter 2.14, where we stopped the last time. And now we continue from there. In the last session, we talked about Punya and Apunya, which is virtue and vice. And we especially refer to frost, fructifying karma. Certain actions lead to immediate results. Those that are very evil actions, actions those are done against, those who are frightened, diseased, old, those who are noble, who come to you for refuge. And if you harm these people, that action comes back to you immediately, the result of that action. And as you can well imagine, the result is not going to be very nice. So that was where we left off. And this session, we continue with verse 2.15. Verse 2.15 is really very special and interesting. I will read the verse at first. Discriminating persons recognize that all worldly objects create some scars of pain due to the nature of gunas and vrittis. Those who have sharp buddhis, who see clearly, they can distinguish between that which is right and wrong, that which is useful and not useful, that which is healthy and not healthy, that which is pain and pleasure. Such a person having a discriminating buddhi recognizes that all worldly objects create pain which means it is not just certain objects that create pain, but all objects. This is what makes a yogi different from others. Most people enjoy material pleasures, worldly objects, and they don't see clearly that even these objects are ultimately causing pain. In the oral tradition, one speaks of the fact that it is the ones you love the most that cause you the greatest suffering. This means your attachment to your children, your attachment to the person you love, is ultimately going to cause you pain at some point of time or the other. You may not see it right now, but eventually when your partner starts getting old and suffers, is getting sick, you also feel and experience pain. When your children are no longer really cute and cuddly, but have become teenagers or adults and they start finding their own way in the world, you also experience pain because you find it hard to let go of them. So it is these people whom you're closest to that actually cause you suffering. And a discriminating person sees this, understands this. So it is no great skill to, to, to recognize pain and suffering in what most people consider pain and suffering. If you do not get something that you deeply desire, you suffer. If you're sick or diseased, you suffer and you see pain and suffering in this, but it is only the very sharp discriminating buddhi or person who sees pain even in pleasures, in all worldly objects, in all relationships. Ultimately, everything causes suffering. So this is chapter 2.15. Here, in this verse, the commentary by Vyasa 
refers to the mind of the yogi, the very sensitive mind of one who has got a very sharp buddhi, will also react very sensitively to everything. His mind is so sensitive, it is like the eyeball. You know how sensitive the eyeball is that even the slightest little speck of dust when it goes into the eye, it bothers you so much that you cannot rest until you have got this slight grain of dust out of your eye. It becomes urgent. You have to get it out of your eye. This kind of sensitivity is the mind of a yogi because he immediately sees the pain even where you don't. So that is an adhikari, a person who sees things differently. And many of us may have found yoga, come to spiritual texts, because you have suffered, but there are very few who come even without suffering, asking very deep and profound questions such as, what is the nature of the universe? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? These profound questions are asked by a yogi of this category. Any questions regarding this verse, 2.15? If you have no background noise, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. Or of course use the chat. Since everything seems to be painful to a practitioner of this high order, naturally he or she aspires to avoid this pain. Verse 16 is very simple. It says, the pain that is to come is to be avoided. Therefore, it implies it can be avoided. We are doing a group of verses here from 2.12 to 2.25, which I have titled Breaking the Alliance Between Karma and Kleshas. And so, The objective behind these verses is to explain to us how to avoid this pain. And that is what will follow in the verses to come. Verse 17 says, The cause that is to be avoided is the union or some yoke of the seer and the seen. So what is causing this pain? The union of the seer and the seen. And what is the seer and the seen? We go to our very nice diagram here that makes it very clear. We have talked about this often enough, but not often enough perhaps. This is the seer at the right hand end. Center of Consciousness, it goes by many names in different philosophies, in Samkhya, in Advaita, Tantra, different names for the same thing. In English, we say individual consciousness, seer, knower. In Advaita, we say Atman, 
in Sankhya we say Purusha. In English it has also been translated as the self. So this is the seer. And what is the scene? Everything else is the scene. All this here, this entire section is the scene. If this is the knower, all this here, the mind, the breath, the body, the senses, and all the objects of the world are all knowables. If the center of consciousness is called the self, then the rest of it, the mind, the body, the breath, is all called non-self, that which is not the self. So, what is the cause of pain? The cause of pain is this union here. This union here is the cause of pain. And what is the purpose of yoga? The purpose of yoga is at first, it is breaking this, what is known as Sami Yoga, is this combination of the seer and the seen. It has got combined, has become one. And the first step is to break this alliance. And that is called Viyog, to break the alliance. That's the first step. Okay. Any questions regarding this? Okay, in that case, we can continue to the next verse. Now that we know what the cause is, we want to understand the nature of the universe. It's very important to understand the nature of these knowables or the scene. It is like you go to war, you're in the battlefield, you need to know who your enemy is. If you don't know what you're fighting, then you cannot fight. So in a sense, you have to understand what the world is made up of. You have to understand these objects of the world and their connection to each other in order to be able to break this alliance, to turn the Samyog into Viyog. So, verse 18 now explains us what this universe is made up of, what this world is made up of. The world consists of the elements, the Bhutas, and the senses, the indriyas, having the qualities of sentience, which is sattva, changeability, rajas, and inertness, tamas. They serve the purpose of experience, of pleasure and pain, and liberation. So, this is essentially describing the tattvas what are the tattvas so try to understand the tattvas here for that we can use this 
permit here. <clears throat> there are 25 tatwas. Now, this is the really basis of Sankhya philosophy of the Yoga Sutras. And while it may appear initially, if you're not familiar with it, a little bit complicated or difficult, it is in fact not difficult. It is quite simple. You see it around you all the time that everything in the world is made up of five Bhutas. The Bhutas are here, earth, water, fire, air, and space. Please remember that this is Shamkhya metaphysics. Metaphysics implies there's a similarity to physics, but it is a spiritual study of the universe. It's not a scientific study in the sense of physics, chemistry being a modern system of science that studies the universe around us. So, in science, you'd say these objects are made of different kind of atoms. And here, we are looking at the world <clears throat> in terms of the elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. When we talk about earth, we are not talking about the mud or the, you know, the dirt in the ground. We are referring to the quality of hardness. If you take an object, like an apple, everybody has seen an apple. It has a certain um, grossness about it. You can touch it. It has a form. That is earth. If you bite into this apple and have a taste of it, that juice, the apple juice, which will come in your mouth, that's water. When you look at the apple, this light, this beautiful red color, that's fire. This apple is occupying some place in the air there. It's displacing air, so you have air. And when you chew into the apple and you crunch it, it makes a sound which travels through space. And there you have an object has these five elements. And that's what the elements mean here. What this basically means is that any object around you has all of these elements. The next come the Tan Mantras. The Tan Mantras are smell, taste, light, touch and sound. They correspond to earth, water, fire, air and space. So that water, that juice of the apple gives a taste. When you smell the apple, you know, you sniff at it, you, you have a special apple smell. And you see the red color because of the light that travels from the apple to your eye. You can touch the apple. It has a certain texture, feels smoother or shiny, however it feels. It, that is touch. The crunching noise, that sound. So this is all part of that object, the knowable. Babies, little children, infants, they, they do this study when they're very small by putting everything in the mouth and they, they spend hours looking at a very simple object. They're studying this object, fascinated by it. And they're actually studying this. This is exactly what they're studying. Smell, taste, light, sound touch. But we have got so used to seeing these things around us that we don't notice them any longer. But in fact, it's very fascinating. If you would take any object that's close to you, around you, look at it. It could be a very simple object. 
but it is quite fascinating. As I described the apple to you, it's fascinating to see it in all these different, from these different perspectives. Next come the organs, the cognitive and active organs. I want to continue to use the apple example. So I'm going to do the cognitive and active organs together. And you see the apple. That's a cognitive organ sight. You reach out for the apple. That's an active organ grasping. You take a bite from the, from the apple and you chew it. Once again, that's an active organ which is being used, chewing, it's one of the active organs and is used for tasting or eating. And that's taste is then a cognitive organ. So you see how the active and the cognitive organs are related to each other. And it is through these that we can know the objects of the world around us. We can study these objects. So these two active and cognitive organs are helping us to understand our world. They are, you can say, to use a computer terminology, they are like the interface. They help us to relate to the world around us and the world gives us certain input and then we put something out in the form of action or speech. So there's a kind of input-output which is happening through this interface. Okay, I realize that some, some of you can't see the text or the screen, but I hope you can now. Is that okay? All right, good. Okay, it's fine. So that's the part of the senses that we can relate to. I think everybody understands through the senses. You may not be really very aware of how your senses are operating, but that is possible only through meditation and self-awareness. And when that happens, it's quite fascinating because you need to study your senses so that you can train them. If you do not study your senses, if you do not understand how they operate and how they connect to all these attractive objects of the world that are around us, it is not possible to train the senses. So we do need to understand both the objects which are attracting these senses and pulling them outwards and how we can train them. So one aspect of the senses is manas. You can say that manas is the coordinator. All the 10 senses, active as well as cognitive senses, need to be coordinated. It's very obvious when you want to eat the apple, there's a hand which moves, there are teeth biting into the apple, there are senses of sight, smell, sound, all which goes into making the experience of eating the apple an incredibly rich experience. Imagine you would eat the apple, but you would not smell it. You could not hear it. You could not even taste it. Uh, that's not 
doesn't sound like a very nice uh, experience of eating an apple. Perhaps it satisfies your hunger, but it would not be quite the same thing as eating an apple that you can taste, you can hear, and you can smell. I hope we all agree on that. So who is the one that's experiencing this apple in this amazing rich manner? That is Hankar, the self-identity. Or rather, Hankara has taken over your sense of identity. It is not the one, but it thinks it is the one. And then there is Buddhi. Buddhi is the one who says, let's eat an apple instead of eating the cake. He's the one who suggested that you eat the apple and avoid eating all the sweets and ice creams and chocolates that I keep talking about in these meetings. So, Buddhi is the one that discriminates. That's the part in you that can be described as conscience, as inner wisdom, as discrimination, different words for Buddhi. But the word Buddhi is nice to use. It's very appropriate, very often because any other word has other implications. And the word buddhi comes from buddh, which means light. So you can say that buddhi is kind of like a light in the mind. It has that quality. It's the closest to sattva. And now we come to the gunas. So rajas, tamas, sattva. Finally, we're here. And we see that that's right on top up there. In physics, we talk about the atoms, but we also talk about the minute particles, which are electrons, protons, and neutrons. So Sankhya metaphysics is a bit like that. It's these three basic particles in physics. It's, it's a corresponding kind of, you know, it, it, I'm not saying that the gunas are atoms, they're not, in fact, but they help us understand that the entire world around us is made up of these three qualities. You experience any object, it will have a certain quality of inertness, it has a quality of changeability, and it has a quality of luminosity. And the one who sees all this right up here is the seer. So from his wonderful place up here, he looks down on all of creation. So this is in fact all of creation here. Any questions regarding the gunas? <clears throat> the gunas, I mean, all the tattvas. These are 25 tattvas. Five Buddhas, five Tanmantras, that is 10. 10 organs of cognition and active organs, that's 20, plus 3, 23. The gunas has been put into 1, that's 24, and the seer is 25. So in Sankhya, we say there are 25 tattvas. For some reason, the gunas have not been counted individually. If you would count them individually, then that would make it 27. Good. I hope that was not too technical. 
it's very useful when you ponder over this for a little bit. It's the basis of the Yoga Sutras, so those who really want to understand the Yoga Sutras and also especially for those who want to go into deeper meditation should try to integrate this knowledge through self-study, not through intellectual study. That's not going to help very much, but definitely um, contemplation on these as true self-awareness is extremely useful. We go back to the text now that you have understood the basis of Sankhya philosophy. What we are talking about here in verse 18 is this, that the scene, all the knowables are made up of the Bhutas, the senses and the Gunas. But what are they useful for? These Gunas and everything that was below the Gunas serves and for the reason of serves as an experience and ultimately for the purpose of liberation so this is the playground this is the playground of this year and by connecting and relating to different objects understanding their impermanence it ultimately leads either to pleasure or pain and eventually to the understanding that i need to get out of these dualities and be established in the seer that was sitting right at the top of the pyramid there and look down upon these from that vantage point absolutely changeless, eternal, and there all suffering would end. So, is that clear? Any questions on this? I'd like to make a short um, announcement here. For some, uh, there was last week a slight um, misunderstanding about the timings. For those who were not aware, we always orient to India because India has only one time zone and because India does not change time during winter or summer. So for those of you who are living in countries where there's a time change, it's very easy. If you orient to India, the meetings are always at 8.30 p.m. Friday, Indian time. So you can just orient to any city in India that you know of, New Delhi, Mumbai, and you will find that um, the time remains the same. And so it's quite convenient and you will not miss the meeting. <clears throat> so we have understood the thought verse now. When we understand this idea in verse 18, that this world serves as a playground, so that we can have our experiences of pain and pleasure and eventually learn to long for liberation and work towards it, then we understand that the world is in fact not a bad place. In fact, its purpose is to help us evolve until we liberate ourselves. 
for a lot of people who come to the spiritual path, they have this kind of escapist idea and these ideas are sometimes a bit misleading because you are in the world, there is no way that you can just get out. You have a body, so you have to live in this world and you need these experiences in order to live out the samskaras that you have stored in your unconscious mind, the latent and the active unconscious mind. Indian tradition, in fact, even says it is worthy to aspire for a long lifespan so that one can live out as many samskaras as possible. It does not mean that you generate more samskaras, but it means you take this opportunity to live out the samskaras that you have in a way that is beneficial to yourself and to others. Verse 19, chapter 2, comes back to the gunas. The gunas are gross or subtle, or they are manifest or unmanifest. So what does this mean? How do we see the gunas on our, sorry, favorite diagram? Not this one. To change it. Yes, this one. <clears throat> Where are the gunas? We said that basically the gunas are the knowables, so everything that's not the self is the gunas. So from this point onwards, there's all the nature of the gunas. So gunas are subtle and gross. Gross are all the objects here in the world, they have a concrete reality the body included, and then it gets subtler. Now the gunas are getting subtler, the breath is subtler than the body, the mind is subtler than the breath, the unconscious mind is also very subtle. So that's what it means. The gunas take a form of things which are gross, objects of the world, body included, as well as that which is subtle. They manifest, they manifest in the form of objects, body included. They manifest also in the form of the mind. And they are unmanifest. That is, they are in this plane here, unmanifest, in the latent unconscious mind. And that is then unmanifested gunas. So that's about the gunas. You can see that they are gross as well as subtle, they are manifest as well as unmanifest. For those of you who also read other translations of the Yoga Sutras, you will find the Yoga Sutra translations so difficult, very academic, mostly these translations have been made by translators who have never been a part of any living tradition. They're purely academic. And because they are academic in nature, they actually make little sense. It becomes quite a waste of time to study those Yoga Sutras, translations that are written by, by persons who do not, who are not a part of a meditative tradition. Everything that we're talking about here comes from the background of meditative tradition. If you will read the same verse in any of the Yoga Sutra translations that are commonly used, you will not be able to understand this.
Any questions regarding the good nurse? I guess not. <laughs> the gunas are quite uh, esoteric in a sense. Verse 20. Individual consciousness or the seer or the knower, different words for the same thing. The absolute knower, though pure, sees through the changing nature of the mind. Now, if we understand this verse using a diagram, it's fairly clear. If you are the seer and you are established here, everything you see, you see through this filter here, the filter of the mind. So though this is pure, what is generally cognizing is buddhi, and that is a part of the mind somewhere here. It is unspecified. And everything is seen through this filter of buddhi. Buddhi is not pure consciousness. Buddhi is not the true knower or the true cognizer. It is part of the mind. It's here or here, wherever it is. It is not pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is here right at this end, right hand side. Buddhi serves pure consciousness. It is not pure consciousness. Buddhi is changeable. Pure consciousness is not. Buddhi comes under the domain of gunas. So a buddhi can be tamasic, a buddhi can be rajasic or sattvic. The purpose of meditation is to sharpen the buddhi and make a tamasic or rajasic buddhi into a sattvic buddhi. This can come only with the purification of the mind. If this is so full here, how can you see through? You cannot. Mind needs to be clear. So that's why it's important to purify. Buddhi is part of the mind. It has no light of its own. Where does Buddhi get its light from? He said that Buddhi comes from the word Buddh, which means light. Where does the light come from? The light comes from here. It's reflected. It's like the moon. The moon has no light of its own. The light of the moon is reflected from the sun. Similarly, buddhi is like the moon. It's reflected light. It's reflected from pure consciousness right here. So you're always seeing through this filter here of the mind and buddhi doesn't see clearly. There's a lot of tamas, there's a lot of rajas, things are changing all the time in the mind. We cannot see clearly. So whatever is presented to the knower is always through this filter. Any questions about this? Okay, then we go back to the next verse. Verse 21. The nature and the essence of the scene that is, all the objects of the world, including buddhi, are to serve as objects to individual consciousness, Nisiya. So, 
everything in the world is to serve the seer. The entire world serves the seer. The purpose of this world is to help us get enlightened. Although the scene has fulfilled its purpose with reference to the enlightened one, it continues to exist because of its usefulness for others. So in verse 21, we said that the nature of the world is merely to serve the seer. So what happens to the enlightened master when he has become enlightened? He doesn't need the world anymore. These objects are no longer required. Does the world end? So, Verse 22 says, though it has fulfilled its purpose with reference to a liberated one, it exists because of its usefulness to others who are not liberated. To understand this a little bit, we can go back to our diagram and we see that all of us have body and senses, breath, conscious mind, active, latent, unconscious. So the pure consciousness is a treasure that's buried in the mind itself, in the latent unconscious mind. It's deep buried inside. It's not outside. It's inside you. And so when the liberated one is free, we have talked about this earlier. It happens when the active and latent unconscious are no longer unconscious. They have become conscious here. So active and latent are also conscious now. So what has happened? This is gone. It's gone. It has been eliminated, annihilated, destroyed. It is now the nature of roasted seeds. All these little samskaras, which are these seeds here, they have no power to germinate. They've been fully destroyed now. And so such a one has basically no mind, you can say. And he is witnessing all the time. So he's looking at everything from here. He's witnessing all the time. Such a person is very strange indeed from the perspective of an ordinary mortal. Such a person is very strange indeed. And he sees things differently. He sees them as they are. While everybody else sees them through the filter of the mind through the coloring and the glaciers. Such an enlightened master has no unconscious mind. What does he do? They are also known as Arihant by the giants, called Arhat in by the Buddhist or avatar by the by, in Hindu Dharma. So these people, they have attained Kervalya and there are two options. This drop of pure consciousness goes back to universal consciousness. When this drop goes back to universal consciousness, I'm just putting an arrow up there. There's universal consciousness, everything basically is universal consciousness. That's the ocean of consciousness. So when it goes back, it merges with that. This person is gone. 
he cannot help us in any way. His identity, his individuality has been dis- has merged with that of universal consciousness. That's Kaivalya. That's total liberation. This person cannot come back to help you. But he can make a choice not to go back, not to return to the source. He can decide to take a body and serve in this plane or in the subtler planes of consciousness of disembodied soul. That is, they don't have this mortal part, but they only have the partially mortal self. And they're called lokas. And they're the different planes of consciousness. And Jivan Muks, for example, they are the ones who are in this plane of consciousness. The active unconscious mind but they don't need to return to the material plane of consciousness to live out their samskaras. Siddhas are in this plane of consciousness, the latent unconscious mind. They do not even need to go to this lower plane, the active unconscious, or to this material world to live out their samskaras. So, Jivan Moks, Siddhas, also need a bit of help and an avatar or arhat or arihant can elect to come back into one of these subtler planes of consciousness and help the residents of these subtler worlds to develop and be liberated. Any questions about this? I have a question. Yes. Uh, I do not understand uh, when when Tabatar comes back to this plane, which is uh, latent and active, uh, uh, based on his choice. Uh, mm-hmm. That's something uh, I do not understand because we are speaking with respect to our individual mind. So. Hmm. Yeah, um, you have to understand that when you go to bed at night, you go to dreaming state. Now imagine that when you're dreaming, God forbid this is not going to happen, but you would die. What would happen? Basically, this part, which is the mortal part here, this would drop away. All this would drop away here. And we are left with Balaji, who is now got active and latent unconscious mind. And since you still have seeds of desire here and here, when you are reborn, you're going to come back to this plane again and acquire a body and live out your samskaras. A Jivan Mokt has lived out his samskaras and doesn't need to come back here. He doesn't need to come back to this world, doesn't need a body. He has only got subtle samskaras which he can live out without a body here. Imagine you're disembodied, you're a disembodied soul basically. And that's what a Jeevan Mukta is. He lives out his samskaras in this plane in this plane and back again here. They are called lokas. They are different planes of consciousness. In English, Christian, Muslim, Islamic traditions, all traditions, we talk of heavens. Basically, that's what these are heavens, disembodied souls. These are nothing other than levels of consciousness. So, those who have a more expanded, um, level of consciousness and who have purified their mind, they attain to heavens. That's what it means. 
And the Siddhas, they don't even have the part about the active unconscious. They only have the causal plane, which is here, which they need to work out. It's extremely subtle samskaras. They don't even manifest in the dreaming. So you understand, they don't take any kind of form, not even a subtle form. They remain in the seed form and they can be worked out in that form itself. So an avatar can come back to one of these worlds and help the Siddhas or the Jeevan Moks. We don't always have to understand everything. Certain things are part of the mystery and this probably is one of those mysteries. Until we get deeper insights in meditation, when you understand the microcosm, you will understand the macrocosm. So this diagram here, this is the microcosm. This is the yogic anatomy. And when you understand the microcosm, you will begin to understand the macrocosm. And that's why we need to meditate or understand this. Otherwise, it remains a mystery. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts about this? I know it's a very, very um, mysterious as well as perhaps inspiring subject. Those of you who do not want to come back to this world and acquire a body and go through the suffering must meditate in a systematic manner so that you can purify, attenuate the samskaras in the unconscious uh, mind, active as well as latent, and be freed. This is not just an intellectual discussion. This is all in the realm of possibility. This can happen if you make up your mind and if you want it. I have one more question. Yes. Uh, does Jivan Mukta and uh, Siddhas uh, are aware of their complete samskara, samskaras or are they, when you say subtle, subtle samskaras? Uh, is mm -hmm. it something they, they also don't, uh, are they not aware of? The Jeevan Moks are obviously not aware of all their samskaras that are in the causal plane, that's in the latent unconscious mind. The Siddhas are, are working out their samskaras which are in the latent unconscious mind. They have already worked out that which is in the active. So the Siddhas have a higher consciousness than the Jeevan Muks. And so there's are working out, which means they're expanding. Uh, that means as they become conscious, the unconscious shrinks. And when they are fully conscious, then they are enlightened. There is no more unconscious. Everything is conscious. And then they can choose. Should I come back and help uh, others? Or should I just leave from this world altogether plunge into the ocean of consciousness okay so very profound subject and we continue this next friday it was nice to have you all here bye bye thanks perry there Bye bye to everyone else. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. Thank you, Shanta. Bye bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, company.